with the, uh, the summit and this opportunity to speak uh, twice about the forced organ harvesting. It is one of the worst uh, human rights crimes of the modern era. Um, it really rivals um, some of the Nazi doctors, Mengele, I think that was Katrina Atlantis' sweat um, analogy, and I think it's very apt. Um, so we have the world's experts on this issue with us this afternoon, and I'm really glad we have a longer period than we did at the uh, plenary session. So uh, let me quickly introduce them, because I know you're eager to hear from our experts. So it's Levi Browd, who is the information, uh, the executive director of the, um, uh, the uh, Fallon Dafa Information Center. You got it. Uh, <laughs> uh, my colleague at Hudson, Nori Turkle, who is um, now the chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. And he is um, an author of a fabulous new book that's very worth while reading for everyone uh, interested in human rights and religious freedom, and that is No Escape, um, out on Amazon. And he had several uh, associations, advocacy associations for uh, Uyghur Muslims in Xinjiang. And then Ethan Gutman, who um, actually bridges both communities, and he has been embedded with both communities, both the Falun Gong and um, also with the Uyghur Muslims. and um, and Kazakh Muslims in, uh, uh, that were from Xinjiang, and has written The Slaughter in the early part of this, uh, well, almost 10 years ago, and has been researching the issue from the early part of this century. Um, this century. Uh, so, uh, and, and, and let me add that Ethan is uh, the world's foremost human rights field researcher on this issue. Um, we are also very blessed today to have with us a remarkable young woman, um, Han Yu, who is with us um, here. And um, you may have seen her video that was absolutely powerful and um, a very moving video testimony of the situation of your father, who was a Falun Gong practitioner arrested in a detention camp. And, and then pronounced dead, um, even though he was a healthy man, as you said. Several months later, you viewed his body, and as you described on the video, um, you saw that his torso had been cut open from top to bottom and, and sewn shut with uh, black sutures. And uh, it really bore every evidence of being a victim of forced organ harvesting. Um, before we start, Hanyu, would you like to give a message to our audience, yeah. just briefly? Thank you so much. Yes, please help stop it. Um, so, forced organ harvesting, again, is um, when a heart patient, for example, calls a, um, a transplant center in China, gets a date certain for maybe the next day or a couple days later, a couple weeks later, to get an organ transplant. Um, the transplant hospital then checks the government database for a tissue match from among a vast network of detainees. Usually these are, um, as we're finding out from the UN and others, um, uh, religious prisoners, religious minorities, particularly primarily Falun Gong, but also now moving to the Uyghur Muslims and other people. Uh, also affecting Tibetan Buddhists, also house church Christians. So um, then the detainee is transferred to a hospital where a surgical team removes their organ, their heart, in this case, and um, while they are still alive, the, the, the um, surgeon performing as an executioner, extrajudicial executioner, um, and then the transplant takes place. This has made China um, the foremost, uh, maybe the first or second um, transplant industry in the world. Um, and it has been done with American, a lot of American help, and we're going to get into that a little bit more today. So um, 
Levi, uh, could you, I'd like to start with you. Could you tell us about some of the features that affect Falun Gong? Like the, you know, what, what, are, what have you found over the years? This has been going on for um, two decades now. Mm -hmm. And uh, give us some, you know, just a few minutes of insights into what, it, what um, happened with Falun Gong. Is this purely profit making? Um, is there a persecution element? Give us some of the insights into what the, ra the reasons are behind this, how it got started, and what the perspective of the various actors. Sure. Um, take this? Okay. Um, thank you very much, Nina. Um, so with Falun Gong, um, there's an interesting thing to notice about the correlation between uh, the imprisonment, the mass imprisonment of Falun Gong and organ harvesting that took off in China. Um, you have to understand, in the 1990s, Falun Gong was immensely popular. There were 100 million people practicing. It was endorsed by the government. It was every park, every village, every town around the country. Um, it was widely celebrated because it brought back traditional values and so forth. So this was a rather abrupt change. And the change was this. The leader of the Communist Party at the time, Jiang Zemin, um, saw in Falun Gong, obviously, an enormous group of people that were outside Communist Party control, a group of people that were restoring traditional Chinese values that the Communist Party had been trying to stamp out for decades. But primarily, he saw a group that was stealing his thunder, to be quite honest. He was a leader that was desperately trying to build a power base, and all everyone around the country was talking about was Falun Gong. And so in the summer of 1999, he himself, over the advice of the Politburo and many leaders of China, ordered that Falun Gong be eliminated. And almost overnight, a highly celebrated traditional Chinese practice becomes public enemy number one. In the ensuing few years, um, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Falun Gong pictures are rounded up, putting in uh, labor camps, sometimes in some of these secret camps that the PLA runs. Um, and John Zeman's order was basically to destroy them financially, destroy their reputation, and destroy them physically. Um, what you saw in the early 2000s is uh, someone or a group of people realized that they could uh, implement Jiang Zemin's order to destroy Falun Gong and also make millions and millions of dollars. This is a billion dollar industry. And so in the beginning of the 2000s, whereas uh, organ transplants were very rare in China beforehand, suddenly if you look at a graph, it suddenly just takes off an exact correlation with the number of Falun Gong practitioners that are being held in prisons. And that's really as it started. It was the perfect mix between implementing John Zeman's order to stamp out Falun Gong and also make a ton of money in the process. And that's, that's really how this whole thing got started. So it was a monetization of persecution, as I like to call it. Um, and has this ended? Nori Turk, I'm going to throw this to you. Thank you, Nina. Thank you so much for your um, continued efforts to uh, shine a spotlight on the, um, the ongoing uh, commercialization of uh, human organs in China. Uh, for the Uyghurs, uh, it's, um, it started as a part of the punishment method um, way back in the mid-90s. Uh, it turned out to be a commercial, uh, commercial it, it, it appears that it has been commercialized in addition to the the punitive nature of the uh, practice in China. Uh, if you look back, uh, the ratcheting up the Chinese pressure on the Uyghur communities uh, started in the mid-90s. After the collapse of the, the Soviet Union, uh, China tried to prevent the Uyghurs um, rising up and demand a political um, sovereignty like the neighboring states. So, And then with the um, uh, February 1997, uh, uh, Uyghur youth took to the street uh, that resulted in a large uh, incarceration of Uyghur religious um, conservative uh, community members. And then uh, following that, there was a mass uh, trials uh, resulting death penalty to the Uyghur dissidents and community religious leaders. Uh, that's how I grew up uh, in China learning about this practice. This is nothing new to me. I knew that you this were was. Born in a yes, I was uh, uh, born in a concentration camp, a re education camp to be exact, which is much like the one that we tried to fight to shut down. But um, I, I spent a lot of time in Kashkar and Urumqi. Uh, Kashkar is, a, is considered as a hotbed for 
uh, Uyghur nationalism. So th there's always been a focus on my place of birth. So, and then uh, in the last several years, uh, particularly since the start of the current crisis, the, the genocide that has been recognized, uh, we've been seeing some disturbing signs. Uh, one, the, uh, the fast track organ transplant at the Oxo airport that came to our attention through a social media posting. Uh, in the early pre period of the ongoing uh, crisis. Um, and we were curious and what on the earth that the airport has that uh, green uh, Chinese and Uyghur language fast track direction. And then uh, before that, including some of my family, friends, and uh, uh, relatives. Okay. That's for the organs from the hospital yeah. to be rushed out to onto the, the plane yes. to be taken Take to- Take it to inland Chinese cities uh, yeah. for organ transplant. And then um, before this was uh, known to us or came to our attention, we were some, somewhat dumbfounded that there was a free health checkup, uh, blood testing, including some of my family, uh, uh, family members and relatives were asking me why would the government uh, offering. And these people that we know did not need to have a free medical checkup. They were in a pension, you know, they had their own health coverage, but they were just literally forced to go to have their blood samples were given. And then in 2019-18 period, uh, Radio Free Asia reported crematorium around the camps that, that, that China has built. And also it begs the question, why would you have that many uh, uh, crematorium adjacent or next to around the same area uh, as those uh, camps? Um, and then around the same time, there's something also very disturbing uh, that we find out that there is a video circulated uh, uh, coming out from Beijing about hollow organ uh, transplant hospital. And the patient was interviewed and he was so pleased. The wait time is short. The hospital is world class. Uh, and and, and, and it was, um, it, the, the gentleman was speaking Arabic. Uh, so, so with that, I think that um, the, the Chinese government's uh, ongoing persecution of the Uyghurs using various methods now become a kind of a commercial or political uh, economy for them. So the halal organ video where they're boasting that uh, the Chinese hospital is boasting that it can offer um, supposedly in halal or kosher, um, as we say, um, uh, organs pitched to um, um, Arab-speaking world uh, um, based on um, Uyghur Muslim, Kazakh Muslim yep. organs. Um, so when, wh about what year was, was all this that you know that This observed? is approximately 2019. Okay, uh, and, so and organs don't have to be halal to be trans. Uh, no, of course not. <laughs> but that's no. one of their methods to promote yeah. market. Yeah, it's sort of clumsy effort yeah. to to market this. Um, and so you have hospitals who are making a pro which are making a profit yeah. and this from is from this in Beijing. And and you have and it also indicates um, a tourism, a, a transplant tourism attracting people from all over the world who can pay because the, the wait time is so short, so yeah. incredibly short. It, you know, uh, uh, kidneys in the United States takes over four years wait list to get a, a, a kidney transplant. Hearts may be a little shorter, maybe it's a couple weeks, but in China it's like immediate for any of these because they go down apparently a, a database of those blood samples and um, tissue screening, right. uh, organ screening. And, um, you know, it, I, it's first emerged, um, as Levy pointed out, um, you know, in, in 2000 and, you know, 2006 in, in the United States, we knew about it, but it's been ignored. And I think um, Chris Smith, Congressman Chris Smith, had a hearing this spring, and there was a, a doctor who was uh, uh, defected, who was part of this um, organ transplant. He came here and talked about it. Um, and he testified before Christmas, Tom Lansley's commission, and said that, you know, it's, it's almost too bad to be true. And that was um, what, uh, you know, it, it, my colleague at Hudson, Peter Hosey, there said to me that he just heard this recently, that people don't believe it. They think it's been completely debunked um, because 
it, China has worked to debunk it through its propaganda and because it's just so horrifying and so extreme, it's hard to believe. But Ethan, can you tell us um, this inflection point of 2015? China has said, um, asserted uh, an un very definitively that they abolished this practice in 2015 and have moved to a voluntarily, voluntary donor um, uh, pool, you know, that th th there would be um, yeah. voluntary donor registry and that all the organs supply, the source of human organs for transplantation would come off of this um, list. What has your field research found? Can you shed light on this? Yeah, I don't want to spend very much time on, on Chinese uh, misinformation, so I'm going to handle that very briefly. The uh, basically, a funny thing happened on the way from China declaring that uh, it was on a voluntary program. And two things happened in particular. One was that we came out with a report uh, in 2016 right after they had announced this, showing that their transplant volume in China was not 10,000, but was actually 60,000 to 100,000 per year. And we were able to prove that. It was a very extensive report. Uh, the, that was widely reported. So imagine that. So let's start with that as a kind of a figure, 75,000 transplants per year. That puts them well, almost twice the volume that America does, by far the biggest in the world. This was very easy to establish. Uh, there were, we found one hospital which was doing about 8,000 per year. A single hospital. They're in every province. That's what follow, and this is what they built on Falun Gong organs. Uh, the second thing is that they, uh, to, to try to reach that kind of volume, because they felt they had to respond in some way by showing some kind of growth, so like 20,000 or so, or 23,000, I think was the number they came up with they started making up the voluntary numbers. Now, the way we know that is because uh, Matt Robertson and Jacob Levy uh, from Israel uh, put together a report where they just basically looked at those statistics. It turned out it was all based on a single equation, which was creating a parabolic curve, uh, and that was the voluntary donation numbers. Now, the chances of that happening in real life are a million to one, and you would only do this if you were trying to cover up something. Presumably, you wouldn't do this with a successful voluntary donation program. The, after that, you are left, uh, I can supply some numbers for right now, which I think represent where we are. Uh, the first is 25,000 to 50,000 Uyghurs are harvested for their organs every year. The average age is 28 years old. Uh, I can't tell you within that framework exactly what that number is. I can say that Falun Gong are still being harvested. I don't know the scale. I know that two of my witnesses from Kazakhstan uh, mentioned seeing Falun Gong in their camps. I've interviewed about 20 witnesses, which is actually a lot. That's far more than anybody's been able to come up with in this world because the Chinese are keeping this very close. But I can say that out of that, two, two people did mention this. They can't tell me how many the numbers, how many Falun Gong were there, because they're not allowed to speak to each other. Everything is under complete surveillance, which is a difference from the Falun Gong days where people did talk sometimes in labor camps. But having said that, uh, and Nuri mentioned the uh, fast lanes, the Oregon fast lanes, and that's true, but it's also true that we found uh, Gulchera Hoja was the one who discovered this from Radio Free Asia, and I've added to it a bit. But basically, we discovered a compound, uh, a hospital that used to be a SARS hospital, then became a religious dissident hospital, and then became a transplant hospital. And then it became a hospital surrounded by a camp for 33,000 Uyghurs. Next to it is a 16,000 camp, 16,000 Uyghur camp. And then just above that, again, this is all within a single kilometer is a crematorium. It is the largest crematorium I've ever seen. There is presumed to be nine of these uh, that were constructed. The order was given a couple of years ago to construct these crematoriums. We know that the uh, guards are all Han Chinese. There's 50 security guards uh, in the Arumchi crematorium, and they're all paid $1,200 a month. This is unbelievable 
uh, salary for that part of the part of the world. And I've never heard of a crematory in my life which has 50 security guards. And I don't think anybody in this room has ever heard of such a thing. Yes, well, there's another thing. While I was doing work on forced labor in Turkey, I happened to run to, into several people who were from Aksu. They didn't even know each other. But I asked them, uh, have you ever driven down this road? And they said, yeah. And I said, uh, anything to report? And they said, yeah, there's a crematorium there. And I said, well, how do you know? He said, oh, well, the smell. Okay, so the smell is of human bones, and then there's a sign. And they just presumed it was all for Chinese because uh, Uyghurs don't like to have their bodies cremated. But I just say this is where, this is where that Aksu compound is 20 minutes away from uh, an airport, Aksu International Airport, which does have a green lane, just like Nuri Turkel described. So that part of it's a bit new, but I want to say one last thing, just in closing. The continuity I see between the witnesses, uh, the continuity of the numbers uh, between the Uyghurs and Falun Gong, are, I mean, I, I'm sorry. I mean, the BBC was calling me up and saying, you know, can you give us some new exciting news? I said, no, it's all the same story. It's just different faces. It's just different ethnicities. Uh, that's the truth. I've seen incredible continuity ever since this rose with Falun Gong, about, from about 2003, 2004 to now. Uh, nothing has changed. And I'd like to point out that the uh, uniqueness of this panel, because we have here today the experts both on Falun Gong, the top experts, and the Uyghur Muslims, and um, we're able to draw this link. I also want to point out that the significance of um, both the crematoriums and the detention camps um, the detention camps have no oversight, and, uh, and they, there's no independent um, uh, Red Cross presence that's going through checking on what's happening and the welfare and well-being of each and every detainee in it. There's no due process. They don't go before judges or courts. There's no sentence. And it gives every opportunity for all kinds of abuses. And we have heard about that with the uh, Uyghurs just recently, with leaked um, police reports um, to our press um, and videos. The Chinese uh, Communist Party was telling us that these were, and telling the world that these camps for with the Uyghurs in Xinjiang were, were simply re-education camps so they could get a vocation, vocational training camps. Um, not re-education camps, vocational training camps. They're emphatically not. The, the internal documents show, the police uh, internal documents, the security internal videos show exactly that they are concentration camps and they're very close to the public. So every opportunity is there for this kind of abuse. The same thing happened with Falun Gong in an earlier era where there was massive um, in, in detention um, after um, 1999, early part of the century, uh, massive detention so that there was, this was a living organ bank essentially for this uh, budding industry in China at the time. Um, and then the, the um, crematoriums, the significance of this is that, um, I mean, Han Yu's case was, father's case was uh, somewhat unique in that um, the family did, and, and Han Yu did view his body but in most cases, the family uh, is not given returned is not given a chance to do that, and instead they are uh, they're told that their loved one has died in prison, or they're told nothing and they're just disappeared, and they're never seen again. And maybe the family is given the ashes um, if if they're lucky. So, um, Levi, um, can you? give us, I mean, China does hide this, um, you, you, no one has access, there is no, uh, you, as Ethan said, communication is, is very, very difficult now, it's constant surveillance. Um, how do you get your evidence of what, how did you piece it together in the early years, um, from the earliest years, that what was going on here? Uh, can you give some examples? Sure. Sure. I, I, I think the early years were tough. The very first word we got was in early 2006. We're actually coming from a doctor or an, and or a doctor, uh, as well as a doctor's relative. And they were the very first ones that came out and said this is happening. 
They got lambasted. Uh, they were called crazy. Um, fortunately, some heroes stood up, one of which is here with us today, Ethan Gutman, uh, David Mattis, David Kilgore. Uh, several of uh, uh, investigators said, we need to take a very close look at this. And it didn't take long to realize these people were telling the truth. Um, if you looked at the hospital uh, websites of some of these institutions, uh, they would be openly advertising what Nina had just talked about. You know, wait times of a week for a kidney that would, or, or a vital organ that would normally take three months. The only way that's possible is to have a large bank of pre-screened people that you're ready to kill um, and to fly in when you want an organ. We also noticed, and what I, what I found was the most shocking, is the admissions by the doctors and the administrated, uh, hospital administrators themselves. We had under, undercover investigators calling into China, pretending that they needed a vital organ. And you have doctors, these are medical doctors, um, hospital administrators openly admitting that they have fresh organs that can be had at any time, that yes, indeed, they're Falun Gong, and isn't that great because the Falun Gong lead a healthy lifestyle. They don't drink, they don't smoke, so these are gonna be very good organs. These are people openly admitting this over phone calls, and it was phone call after phone call after phone call. Um, and in many cases, we had a couple investigators around the room, like David Kilgore was sitting there as we would call um, to authenticate the number and who we're talking to. I found that the most shocking, and it's been difficult in more recent years, uh, because for obvious reasons, they've, they've been uh, uh, very careful what they say, but even as, as, as recently as a year and a half ago, some are still doing this, admitting over the phone that they have Falun Gong and, and, and they can come and get. So I think this was uh, uh, an enormous piece of evidence. Um, Ethan already talked about a, a couple of things that I think were obvious. The, the blood tests that um, uh, Nuri mentioned are still going on. You know, you have cases and cases and cases, hundreds and thousands of cases of people who are being tortured or mistreated, or even just they were at home and the police came and ransacked their home, and at the end of the ransacking, they take a blood test. Um, and so people who are being abused all over China, um, Falun Gong, Uyghurs and so forth, are being blood tested in situations that just don't make sense. Um, so I think this was sort of some of the more compelling evidence. There is one thing I just wanted to touch upon, what Eaton mentioned. I mean, he gave the right numbers. I think those are the most authenticated numbers in terms of how many people are being killed on organ harvesting a year. What is astonishing to me is even if you took the Chinese government at their own, at their own word, they said they have a million donors. They say they have, you know, in, 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 in 2019, they have a little over 8,000 uh, people who actually donated. Even if you run those numbers, this means that the donation network inside China is percentage-wise 62 times more affected at yielding an actual donor from the donor pool than America. We, we've had decades and decades of a donor network uh, situation. So even if you use their numbers, which are wholly inaccurate for the reason that Ethan described, they don't even add up. It's completely nonsense. And so I think those were some of the things that really we looked at and said, this must be happening. There is no other explained source other than Falun Gong and then eventually the Uyghurs, some Tibetans, some house Christians. That's where these organs are coming from. Yeah, I, I met a um, Christian from Xinjiang who was in the camps that I guess Ethan uh, had first met over in uh, abroad, and um, he brought him here and with others, a team of a group, the Victims of Communism Foundation, um, brought him here this spring, and he was blood tested. You know, he was uh, terribly abused once he got into the detention uh, center in Xinjiang. He was there for 10 months, but when he was admitted, he, they gave him a complete physical and, and heart tests and heart screening. Um, I asked him about that specifically and uh, extracted his blood. And the significance of that is that you need to have that kind of um, <coughs> um, testing for medical testing for an organ match so the organ isn't rejected. Um, the UN special uh, uh, rapporteurs or, or experts uh, 12 of them got together in an extraordinary move a year ago this month and um, said that they were deeply alarmed. They were alarmed by what they were hearing now um, about this continuing practice of uh, testing um, detainees uh, for their blood and screening their organs that are um, transplantable. Um, and that they were from all various religious minorities in China um, and that it was continuing. 
and that they were alarmed that this was, um, you know, really solid evidence of uh, forced organ harvesting. <coughs> so, um, so the the, the various um, ways of demonstrating this then has been through case testimony. It's been observed clues. And it's been testimony from a range of actors, from what you're saying, from, from doctors to uh, prison guards to um, the families of the victims, like Hanyu, and um, also from the um, transplant recipient. Yeah. And then, then, then there's statistical evidence that Matthew Robertson and uh, David Levy have, have done. Um, yeah. Ethan, do you, you look I like you really want to say something. I really want to say something about that because um, I really, you know, it was very nice of you to say what you did about uh, me and, and, and Kilgore and made us. I, I do appreciate it, especially I, I, I miss David Kilgore so much. But uh, the fact is, look, who are the people who really stood up here? Enver Tonti the doctor, who had no reason to do so, stood up in a London parliamentary meeting. He could barely speak English at the time. He had such a thick accent. And he stood up and, and said, they said, you know, open up for questions. And he said, I don't have a question. I have a story. And he basically said, I did this with my own hands. And he did. He had killed a man. And, you know, as he's told the story over the years, it's become more and more intimate. He's basically, he never used to say this, but he points out this man was shot in the chest, but he could have lived. He, was, he could have survived. I, he was in a condition to make that man survive, but he was terrified. Instead, he was just following the orders that he was told to do. Remove the kidneys, remove the liver, do it as quickly as possible, then sew up the body. So he, he killed a man, essentially. This was an incredible admission. Uh, and, and, and at the time, he was so scared afterwards, Mary, that he, he thought that the police would come to his door and arrest him, even though this had happened all the way back in 1995. Uh, so I think those kinds of people are heroes. I think you're a hero. I think the people who stand up and talk about this, uh, the witnesses in Kazakhstan, they had nothing to gain by talking to me. It was nothing but risk to talk about their experiences in the camps. Some of them have, not because of me, but some of them have already been sent back to Xinjiang to their deaths. I only have tape recordings. That's what's left of them. So this is the risk out there, and it's a terrible risk. Uh, and this is the long arm of China is felt so strongly uh, out in the world, especially today, even worse than it was during Fall and Gone because of the surveillance methods, of course, have gotten so much better. So yeah, and, and I would caution you, on you from going to Europe because of Interpol, and um, there are, China is known to grab people um, who are from China who um, report human rights abuses of all kinds. So it's a real danger. People are harassed in this country, in New York State. Um, and on some of our campuses. Um, so the, the, there was another compelling piece of evidence that um, was astonishing, shocking. It was Matthew Robertson again, um, the Australian a scholar and statistician who, and I, I guess he did it with his partner, is that correct? Uh, David, uh, Dr. Uh, David Lavi from Israel. Um, they uh, did an algorithm of Chinese medical journals for the word heart transplant and um, intubation, it, it, words that would indicate the patient was alive when the heart was extracted by the surgeon. These were articles written by surgeons in Chinese language journals, and they um, unearthed I think 72 uh, examples, articles, involving hundreds of medical personnel uh, admitting that they were extracting organs and killing the person at the same time. Um, they didn't uh, go into who these um, victims were, um, but we know from other people's testimonies that it was most likely 
um, either Falun Gong or the Uyghur Muslims or other religious minorities. Um, Levi, can you, would you want to add something? Or Yuri, Nori, would you like to uh, yeah. uh, discuss? Uh, the um, as for personal testimonies, um, <coughs> evidence, <coughs> during the process of writing yeah. that book that yeah. you um, I mentioned earlier, I've spoken to camp survivors, uh, direct, indirect victims, uh, physicians. Um, I happened to go to me, uh, school in inland China, and most of my Uyghur friends were students at Xinjiang, uh, Xi'an Medical University, now either practicing medicine here back home or completely uh, pick up a different profession. So I consulted, learned, uh, including our mutual friend Enver. Um, and one consistent story that I've been hearing from all of the people that I interview is uh, involuntary medical checkup, blood testing, and in some instances, some Uyghur prisoners forced to take a mysterious pill that control their ministerial uh, emotion. And in uh, last December, the United States government uh, added uh, Chinese uh, military medical academy and its 11 affiliates for developing brain control weaponry to be used for ethnic and religious groups in China. This is the country, this is the nature of the regime that we're dealing with. I wanted to be mindful about that. And also, um, some of the, uh, the uh, DNA sequencer sequence related reports published early on in 2019, 2020, uh, pointing to a American scientist at the Yale Medical School uh, and also um, uh, Thermo uh, Fisher Scientific, uh, the, C the DNA sequencer maker, also uh, help us to gather some information. So there's a lot of information out there, a lot of courageous people sharing their stories, taking the risk, but the question now becomes, what do we do about this? How do we hold those doctors, those hospitals to account? Well, um, Nori, you bring up the issue that I think is even more stunning, if possible, than what is happening in China. After all, we've had a glimpse here of uh, China's depredations during the um, and, and, and unethical activity during COVID and the pandemic in the early days then, um, when they hid so much information and allowed the pandemic to spread. Um, and that is that there is. Um, enormous collaboration between American universities and colleges, medical schools, and um, hospitals, transplant hospitals, with the Chinese uh, hospitals, transplant hospitals. And um, basically, China has become the first, or next to the United States, or uh, the second next to the United States, or the first in the world in transplantation. Um, thanks to this Western support, it wasn't just the United States, but the United States heavily, heavily have supported China in this. And Levi, could you uh, tell us more about that? Yeah, unfortunately, this is a chronic problem across every industry in the United States and in the West when it comes to the CCP. Ignorance and money. Um, it really comes down to those two factors. Um, on this particular topic in the medical industry and the transplant industry specifically, um, even today, there are hundreds of Chinese students studying transplant, studying, become transplant doctors here in America. And that represents a tremendous conflict of interest for institutes here. For example, there was a doctor at, uh, at, a, at a transplant institute in Utah who is very much involved in an NGO that's exposing transplant um, abuses in China, those crimes, and he wanted to bring that to the attention to his institute. And when he brought it up, he was, the, his superior was very candid. He said, if you talk about this here, we lose all our Chinese students and they all go to Texas. And that's where they're going to get educated. And, and for that reason alone, that issue is no longer talked about. That's one specific story of an epidemic that I think, um, according to Torsten Trey, who, who heads up the Doctors Against Forced Organ Harvesting organization, um, is rampant in, in, the, in the transplant industry. And it, he sees it as two issues. I mean, one issue, there are people who would, who would sort of who feel bad about this, but they're very conflicted because this is a very dark stain on their, on their trade, on, their, on, on their, what they do, and they're not really, really con they're very conflicted on what to do about that. Um, and then there's others who, um, because of the economic interests 
Um, and it's, you know, as we were talking before, it's not just training doctors. This, this is an entire industry. It involves funding, it calls partnerships, technology, all of that was trained by and large by the U.S. and other Western countries. And were this issue to come out, it means all these institutions, all that money fades away. And that's a huge conflict of interest. Um, and I mentioned ignorance at the beginning because that is also plays a role. I mean, there is, there is an epidemic of ignorance about the CCP by and large across the Western world. They don't believe, they can't quite fathom that uh, a government, it's really a party, would be this evil that would actually do these things. And so you have these two forces where the non-believers out of ignorance and the people who have economic interests that are causing this whole issue um, to stay silent. And I wanna give you one example because I talked about this being an ep epidemic across all industries. Uh, there was a New York Times correspondent in China, Beijing, who was gonna cover this. Um, they got the green light, they're doing some investigation. They hear doctors, and this is in 2016, so this is after they're supposedly not using prisoners of conscience or anything like that. She's investigating this, she hears these doctors openly talk about they're still using prisoners of conscience. They didn't even know that the government officially had banned it. And so she knows all this stuff. She testifies before the China Tribunal, which occurred about a year and a half ago, probably the most exhaustive uh, investigation into organ harvesting in the world. Um, and she was gonna report this story and her higher ups at the Times killed it. And so that feeds the ignorance. And again, you've got this economic interest, you've got this ignorance, and it's just a vicious cycle that has really kept this thing quiet. Um, doctors against forced organ harvesting have chronicled the names of, I think it's 340 plus Chinese transplant surgeons who have been trained in American um, in, in the United States, trained in their um, profession of transplant surgery in, in the medical uh, schools or um, hospitals in the United States. And they have not only the names of the Chinese doctors, they have the schools <coughs> in the United States where they were trained at. How do they know this? From their own bios. Um, if you go into the hospital registry or the um, or journal articles, medical journal articles, um, um, you will find these Chinese transplant doctors' names and their bios. Um, and it is, um, yeah, it is more than training. It's, it's uh, educational exchanges, it's fellowships, it's um, research, research money, joint research money between American transplant hospitals and Chinese transplant hospitals um, and um, publications. The, um, you know, it, it amazes me that there is no, so little curiosity on the part of American transplant hospitals and medical schools, and these are the preeminent schools. So I'm gonna name names. It's Harvard, it's Stanford, it's University of Pittsburgh. Um, I'm sure, Levi, you know a lot more. Um, it, it, there are scores of them in the United States um, that, um, that, that are um, collaborating with the Chinese transplant sector. And I think maybe they started out with altruism, um, altruism mixed with ignorance. Um, China wasn't rich then, but, um, and, and there was the prestige that goes along with um, this, these international links. And then pretty soon you had not only um, funds flowing the other way from China to the United States, but they still go from the United States to China. Um, you also had this influx of students um, that the universities depend on and which China can hold out as a, in a way, you know, that this is going to be withdrawn, as you said. Um, so it's um, extremely troubling, and I'd like to get um, your reflections, starting with uh, Nori and then Ethan and Levi um, on medical ethics. And in, in the United States, uh, transplant sector is obsessed with trying to find um, organ supplies um, because there is a shortage of organs. People are dying every year for lack of organ tra to transplant. And um, they're experimenting with different um, blood techniques to make the matches easier or um, with pig hearts, um, but they never seem to ask the Chinese how they do it. How, how do these hospitals, 
have an unlimited supply or have such an enormous yield from their donor registry, as you explained. So, um, Nori, would you like yeah. to take off? <coughs> yes. Um, <coughs> the, um, the practice is ongoing uh, partly because it has not been costly for either the hospitals or the doctors, and uh, there is no uh, a proper uh, a, a, a consequential uh, actions that the U.S. government, for example, could take on them other than perhaps uh, applying some sanctions measures. Those doctors, those hospitals uh, should be, should be um, prevented uh, specifically the doctors, those 340 plus doctors, should be prevented f uh, traveling around the world freely. Uh, why would we allow them to come here knowing that they have been complicit in the ongoing crime against innocent people? And also, we should also hold our hospitals, uh, university hospitals to be exact. Um, I named uh, Professor Kenneth Kidd, who brought in uh, a, an official, known official from Chinese Minister of Public Security to his lab at the Yale Medical School, conducted DNA study of the Uyghur DNA samples. So what is the consequence? He was on NPR, did not even acknowledge with a straight face that he knew of his lab assistant, uh, was an employee of uh, Minister of Public Security. So these kind of practices should stop. We can we can be unhappy and we should be uh, critical of uh, the ongoing uh, organ harvesting in China, but what do we do to stop here the medical cooperation between our academic institution, our hospitals with the ones in Beijing? Uh, yes, I, I agree completely. And there's an another doctor, um, absolutely <coughs> shameless, is Dr. Francis Delmonico of Harvard University, a Mass General. He um, was, uh, he befriended uh, someone named Wang Jiafu, who was Vice Minister of Health, but he was also a, a central committee member of the Chinese Communist Party, according to the Carnegie Endowment uh, for Peace in their register. Um, and uh, this uh, Wang Jiafu, the CCP central committee member, uh, proposed a task force to advise WHO, the World Health Organization, on um, ethical practices of organ transplant. And uh, they made uh, uh, Delmonico, uh, the Harvard professor, um, a Harvard doctor, surgeon, transplant surgeon, um, the head of it, the chair of it. And um, Ethan, you were saying in the plenary the other day that, that they uh, never asked you, never took you up on your offer to listen to detainee tapes. And, um, that took no interest in deta detainees and what was happening to them and these uh, egregious reports that um, there was, they were being used as a living organ bank against their will, obviously. Yeah, I mean, a lot of this comes down to, to uh, simple human. Uh, Westerners do not like to lose face either. They do not like to reverse their own decisions or what they've, what they've said are their decisions. Look, but by doing this, and, and I'm not letting Beijing off the hook here, they're, they're number one, it's their fault that this is, we're in the situation we're in, but the, it is true that the World Health Organization and the Transplantation Society are doing a great disservice to China because China's future, seen in a practical level, is pharmaceuticals. That is their pillar industry. They've always known it. They have a huge population who can be experimented on. They can r run drugs out very quickly. Uh, that's where the money is, not in organ harvesting. There's plenty of money in organ harvesting. I, I think it's 10 billion a year, but that's nothing compared to the, the real payoff. If you if you think about it that way, uh, it's you know. They will never succeed in pharmaceuticals. China will never. Nobody has any trust in China. Now, that's partly because their Sinovac was a disaster. Well, it's COVID, yeah, the, the pandemic. Okay, and the pandemic, obviously, the pa and the pandemic, and, and the, the, their terrible vaccine. Uh, but also because the whole system has been completely corrupted by organ harvesting. You know, we're often asked, and I'm sure this has happened to, to you, too, uh, that... You know, where does the money go? Follow the money. Well, we can't follow the money in China, but we know it's divided up much like a gang divides up a bunch of drug benefits, you know, after they sell a bunch of cocaine. 
the money gets divided. That's all we know. I think it's important to recognize that the Transplantation Society is not doing itself any favors. Uh, and the sooner that we move to what Nori Turkel is talking about, to a system where we completely ban all contact with the Chinese transplant, uh, any entities involved in it, uh, very similar to what happened to the Soviet psychiatrists during the Cold War. This is where we want to be. This is, at this point, this is the only answer. Thanks. Thanks. Well, um, I think a first step is going to be the passage of the Stop Forced Organ Harvesting Act. Um, and, um, you know, Chris Smith is backing that, Congressman Chris Smith, who spoke at lunch today. Uh, he's a stalwart on all these issues and uh, human rights issues. And it has 30-plus um, bipartisan members of Congress supporting it now, and it has a Senate companion, and hopefully it'll be called by, um, you know, for a vote at some point, but um, before the end of the term. But that's the first step, which is going to require the registration of every medical institution um, that uh, collaborates with China. Um, that will be a start. Um, uh, I want you all to think, if you, ha if, if you have any questions, we may have a minute or two for that. Okay, good. Um, but would you like to have yeah, a last word on, the, on whether they, medical institutions have taken you seriously? Um, I, I, I think, I, think yeah, I would come back to the medical institutions have been trying to save face and trying to save money and some ignorance, and that's, that's and I think uh, both gentlemen here are absolutely right on that, and, and as well what you talked about. I wanted to raise one point that, it was a point that was sort of a metaphor that David Maidis actually brought up in terms of the impact of not doing anything. You know, when he was doing a, he made an, al uh, uh, an analogy between um, the COVID vaccine and, uh, sorry, the, the COVID virus and, and um, forced organ harvesting. It's not a metaphor, and I think one of the things, he, he pointed out is that it, what would it mean to stop forced organ harvest in China? For real, stop it. That means we have to have enough transparency into their medical system to understand what every single hospital is doing. That's the only way in the short term to stop it. If the world had taken that seriously and we had those mechanisms in every single hospital, guess what? One of them would have been in Wuhan and we would have seen what was happening and things would have been very, very different. Well, is that point true? Taiwan proves it's true because Taiwan had exactly that. Taiwan doctors on WeChat were with, on, on WeChat with the Wuhan doctors the night the virus first was discovered in the hospital. In, in days, Taiwan was shutting down flights to Wuhan, several days later shutting down flights to all of China, and look at what happened to Taiwan. For the first year and a half of the pandemic, they were on a different planet. They had days and days and days of zero cases. And so I think that is a very real example that this is not just a metaphor, it's not just doing the right thing. This is real. Not taking forced organ harvesting seriously could have directly rela been related to the, to the pandemic. Yeah, and definitely related to what happened to the Uyghurs then too. Uh, Susan, you had a question? Go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Speak up, because I guess we don't have a... Okay, and these rooms sort of absorb uh, <laughs>
first of all, you can't beat Genevieve Bujot yeah. in, I mean, come on, give me a break. It's an incredible movie. My favorite movie of medical thrillers. But, uh, now there have been some films that have been made. Uh, it's middling success. Uh, when I was talking to the BBC, they've been working on something for some time. This is not a terribly visual subject. Let me just state that right now. Uh, most of the witnesses, the most important people you will ever talk to, you can't put them on camera. And now some of them, as I said, have, have just gone. And I think the BBC and a lot of other, and a lot of other documentary filmmakers have struggled with exactly this problem. Okay. Um, to, one, to, one minute, because I think, no, go ahead, go ahead. Um, just want to let you know, it, 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 it's the same problem as, as every other industry. There actually have been a couple very compelling um, documentaries done. Um, Kay Ribicek, you want to stand up for a second? Uh, she's the producer of one of them uh, in, in the building. But they've hit the, hit the same problem when it came to distribution. No one wants to touch this as a documentary issue, just like they don't want to touch it as a medical issue. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Faith, did you have a quick question or a quick comment? Okay, that's a great idea. But my question is, um, uh, I, I'm with the Committee on Suppressing Danger in China, and uh, we have the No TSP for CCP campaign going on right now, and there's a connection, you know, human rights connection about organ harvesting, but you're making me think it might be an even deeper connection. Yeah. Are any of those, those capital markets that are being put into Chinese companies, are they going into the Chinese companies that are involved in organ harvesting? Um, I think the answer is yes. For sure. <laughs> but we'll, we'll get together. Right? Okay, that's the end of our program. Thank you all very much for coming. Really appreciate it. And I, I, and I do. Her courage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Learned a lot from you.